On the cover coming up is a man a lot of you here know. He is one of the biggest influencers in the entertainment industry. It is Scooter Braun. Scooter is the founder of SB Projects. He is one of the biggest power brokers in the world. In California, bi-coastal, everywhere. Uh, he reps the big, the big guys. Kanye West, Justin Bieber, Ariana Grande. He's been named one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world. He's a Grammy-nominated producer. And he's also passionate about giving back. He's currently spearheading the hand-in-hand -hand benefit for hurricane relief telethon that's airing on every major network on September 12th. Scooter will front the November issue of Success. That month we are talking all about the powerful role gratitude plays in all of our lives. Gratitude is the theme for that month. So it's everything. If we are appreciative of the blessings and the people we have around us, it's amazing how much more motivated uh, we are to do and be more. And gratitude is a, a trait that Scooter and his brother, Adam Braun, were raised with. They come from an incredible family. I want to introduce you first to Adam Braun. Through Adam's experience, he's learned the power of gratitude for so many things, uh, even as seeming, seemingly small as a pencil. He is the founder of of Pencils of Promise, an award-winning nonprofit that has built more than 400 schools across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. It's a, it became a dream of his when, as a student, he was traveling and he, he met a young boy uh, in India who uh, he was talking to and he, and he asked him what he wanted most in the entire world. And the boy thought about it. And his answer was simply, profoundly, a pencil. So it became the founding inspiration of Pencils of Promise. And last year, Adam moved from New York to San Francisco to launch his latest venture. It's called Mission U. It is a completely debt-free college alternative built for the 21st century. Anybody with college debt that that would sound pretty good to? I'd take that. I would take that. It's backed by some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley, and CNN described it as perfect for young people eager to launch their careers. Their first class received almost 5,000 applicants for only 25 spots. Big success. A lot of interesting, amazing things to come from Mission U. It's my pleasure to introduce to you now, welcome him, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Braun. Uh, well, um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, as you heard, um, I relocated uh, from New York where uh, myself and my brother and our entire family uh, were born and, and primarily raised uh, out to the Bay Area about a year and a half ago. And uh, now as a Californian, uh, it um, is truly, truly uh, a pleasure to uh, spend time with uh, folks that are uh, incredibly like-minded. And one of the things that um, I've seen just in you know, a few hours here today is there is a commonality between every single person in this room. And it is a commitment to better both ourselves as well as those around us and our businesses and our organizations. And uh, I have the distinct pleasure today of interviewing somebody that I've spent a little bit of time uh, talking to. Um, so uh, as you heard, uh, my uh, brother, uh, Scott Scooter Braun, uh, has had an absolutely extraordinary career. Uh, from beginning in his early days uh, at Emory in Atlanta, uh, rising to the top of um, the hip-hop world over there, to then relocating to Los Angeles where he discovered and broke some of the you know, largest pop stars in the world today, and along the way also building SB Projects, a company with you know, world-renowned talent uh, that has helped develop 
uh, everything from television shows that we know today like Scorpion to producing films and a huge part uh, that I've seen out of my brother at every step of the way has been his commitment to philanthropy and uh, to increasing the well-being of others and leading the way through example with each and every one of his artists. And so uh, it is, again, uh, a pleasure for me uh, to share a conversation uh, on a stage uh, in front of um, a bunch of uh, folks who have taken the time to be here today. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, my brother, Scott Scooter Braun. <laughs> That was actually amazing because right before we were about to come out, I had the incredible urge to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and um, I was like, I got to pee. And my brother said those really nice things about me so I could run to the bathroom. Yeah. And he was stalling. And that's actually the nicest things he's ever said about me. <laughs> and so I'm just going to, like from now on, I'm going to be like, I got to pee. And then just see what happens. Um, yeah, hopefully it wasn't too obvious to you all that I was just buying time so that... Yeah, um, I, I washed my hands. We're good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let's just dive right in. I mean, um, you know, when you think about the early days of our childhood, uh, obviously the, the theme uh, of both this publication as well as this event is, is success. Um, you know, when we were kids, how did you define success when you thought about your life ahead? Oh, okay. Um, he's going to be good at this. Uh, when we were kids, we, we moved, um, when, when our parents had me, I was the oldest and I was the mistake. Um, and they couldn't even afford to live together at the time, but by the time we were seven, they were able to move us to a really nice suburb so we can go to one of the best public school systems in the country. And I remember seeing kids who had a lot more than us. And some had, you know, a lot less than us. And um, you start to get this in a capitalistic society, this idea of wealth. And I asked my dad, are we rich? And my dad said, yes. And I was like, really? And he goes, well, as long as you have love from your family, you're always rich. And um, so that was, that was my first kind of idea. And then by meeting kids who had trust funds and extreme wealth to, you know, my two best friends who were Colombian immigrants who's dad, you know, drove the cab and their mom was the, you know, a housekeeper, um, I got to see that the majority of my friends who had a family that I wanted to be around weren't the ones with the, with the financial wealth. Most of my friends with the financial wealth were the ones wanting to come to our house or other friends' house because their dad or mom wasn't around. Um, and I made a commitment. I actually spoke at a Goldman Sachs thing last year. And I said, it's actually, you know, most of the kids who have parents working at this place that were screwed up. So I challenge you guys, instead of making the big deal, the biggest thing you're ever going to do in your life is raise your kids. Um, so I guess my definition of success is what I'm finally having now in my life, which is, you know, you, you're blessed to have my niece and nephew, and, uh, and I have a two-and-a-half-year-old and a, a nine-month-old, my wife, and that's the most successful thing I've ever done. Um, so... You know, one of the things when I think back to like family trips, right? Is me hitting you. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll lay the scene for everybody in the audience. Uh, we would go to wherever we went to, right? And inevitably, you know, our dad would go and like play sports and our mom would go do something. And, you know, <laughs> her mom would go do something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she'd, she'd read a book. Remember, she, my mom's a, a, a big reader. And just so you guys know, I still call him Scott, and so I'll refer to him as Scott rather than Scooter on, on uh, my birthday. On the stage. Let's do it. So um, Scott and I would go uh, and like meet other kids, and our sister would join us. And inevitably, in the first, you know, four to five minutes, it would just become clear that everybody knew Scott, and Scott knew everybody. And so, you know, one thing that I've been fortunate to see across the course of my life is, you know you are blessed with this incredible gift for being able to read a room and just naturally build honest and authentic relationships with people. And if you had to drill into it, like, how do you think that developed? Why do you think you have that ability that I've never seen in any other person to the extent that you possess it? Oh, this is, this is great. You guys know how... This is, no, this is... He's, one, he's, he's good, but two... You know, we, I love my brother. He's my best friend in the whole world. But we used to beat the shit out of each other. 
You know, so, oh, yeah. So, like, having him be like, how do you have this ability that no one in the world has? It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. I'm, like, sitting there, I'm like, this is, this is like therapy. This is amazing. Um, look, I, I think since I was a kid, um, so I was a 4 foot 11 freshman in high school. I grew 12 inches in high school. Um, so I was always really small. People thought we were twins or he might be my older brother. It was great. It was absolutely great. <laughs> but, um, but I would win the fights because I was crazy and I would sure. take it to places that, yeah. Um, and uh, I always kind of put myself in other people's shoes. Um, mm -hmm. If I went to see a comedy, I didn't really enjoy the comedy unless I was looking at you and seeing if you were laughing. Um, so whether it be, um, you know, going online and having to think, what does a 15-year-old girl like for, you know, marketing Justin Bieber or switching over, you know, to figuring out what, you know, is the Kanye fan thinking or, you know, why would a show like Scorpion work? Um, I think I've always had this ability of kind of feeling what other people feel. And I always kind of tell my staff when we talk about it, I said, my gift is being extremely ordinary. You know, I, I've always found myself to, to be very, you know, the opposite of special. So if I feel something, I assume someone else feels it because I, I don't think extraordinary. I think like the masses. And I, and I can put myself in other people's shoes, so I think that's actually the gift. It's, you know, extraordinary people think in extraordinary ways. I think like an ordinary person, the only difference was before we went to sleep every single night since we were a kid, our dad always would tell us bronze are different every single night. I don't know when it started because it started so early. I'm now doing it with my son who's two and a half and my nine month old. And we used to, I remember we used to stay up and be like, all right, dad, whatever, bronze are different. And then he'd explain to us, it doesn't make you better than anybody, but I, I think you're extraordinary, so I'm going to hold you to extraordinary standards. And I think over time we started to believe that. We thought we could do anything. You know, if, if we truly thought we were equal to anybody. If you could do it, why can't we? And um, so that gift of kind of just understanding the common man, because I was one, I was the common man. It just, the only difference was I believed that I could do irrational things in my life. And, you know, I've heard from friends, and one of my friends said, he was like, no, nothing rational ever became great. It's the irrational ideas that become great. And uh, it was this extreme belief of why not, combined with the talent that no one else in the world has, only me, according to my brother, <laughs> um, of being able to put myself in people's shoes. And, um, I mean, I remember, like, a big moment for you in the earlier parts of your career was when, um, in a magazine, Creative Loafing, right? Oh, that's, yeah. That's yeah, I mean, back in the day, like, when Scott was in Atlanta, this major article came out um, that profiled him, and it was really complimentary, and it talked about the rise of, of his career, and hold he was on, really young. On. Not so complimentary. I'd never done a photo shoot before, and I got there, the and it was the cover this of this, this creative loafing was like the village voice, and you know, like, of Atlanta, and I get there, and they're like, put on this purple shirt, <laughs> sit on this couch, hold a phone here, smirk. And now we're going to put these two models around you. And we're going to call it the Hustler. And I was like, sure, I've never done this before. <laughs> and my 30th birthday, my friend broke out that picture. And they've had a field day ever since. Now, luckily, I think they ran out of like data to hold the picture on the website. They might have budget cuts or something. And they took the picture down. It was like the greatest day of my life when they couldn't find that. Well, what I was thinking about was in that article, there was an interview with some major artists at the time who described you as having concentrated hustle, right? Remember that? And I think that especially you know, in the earlier parts of your career, what I saw was certainly that. Now, it's still there. I mean, the whole ride here, you were busting your ass on the phone, making things happen the whole time in the green room beforehand. Um, you have we got a, a benefit on Tuesday. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. Yes. I, I'm going to be very direct. Everyone needs to donate if you can. You can clap out, like, afterwards. I haven't slept, so I might be delirious. I'll interview and interrupt my brother. What he's talking about, because it's top of mind, is there's a hurricane that's going to hit Florida very shortly. We had an awful hurricane in Texas. And 
my friends and I are putting together the entertainment community. We're taking over every network for an hour from eight to nine, commercial free. And the hardest part is we've done the research and we found someone, Michael Dell, to underwrite our entire production. So every dollar is going to charities that actually are still on the ground after Sandy, still on the ground in Haiti, charities that actually make a difference. And every dollar that you donate will actually go to people that need it. So when that opportunity comes on Tuesday. So, yeah. um, so and, and he, what he's talking about is I haven't found someone to perform in New York yet. Yeah. So I'm freaking out. Um, but, but the question is really, like, you've always had that motor, right? And, and what do you think um, that motivation to succeed comes from? And do you think it's nature or nurture? <sighs> uh, I think a part of it was responsibility. Our, our grandparents on our dad's side are survivors of the concentration camps. Our grandmother was in Auschwitz and our grandfather was in Dachau. Um, and on my mom's side, her dad died when she was 11 years old pretty suddenly, and she grew up with nothing. So here we were with, you know, two parents who were dentists with giving us an opportunity, and there was a meal on the table, and, you know, we had means. And I just felt this guilt of being a first generation. There wasn't a trust fund, but I knew everything was taken care of. And, um, and I, I felt this extreme guilt. It's actually why I went to Atlanta, changed my name to Scooter, and said I was from my dad's neighborhood in Queens because I was embarrassed of saying where I was from. Um, and at first it was that, then it was a combination of just this extreme fear of failure um, that I, I wanted to live up to what people thought of me and I wanted, I wanted to succeed. And then once you got a level of success, you'd get an identity within that success and you didn't want to let go of that identity so you keep building on top of it. And then when I got to a point in my life now where um, I'm very blessed to be able to say financially I'm in a place where I don't worry about that whatever let's cut the bullshit I don't worry about it anymore um, but then I had my children and I had this um, this epiphany when you when you make life you understand death for the first time and for anyone who has a child they'll understand that um, and those of you who don't it, it's an amazing thing when it takes place but you're holding someone and you're like why do I love this person more than anything I've ever loved before but I don't know them and they don't know me and I've worked really hard for a long time to be the person I am in the world and they know nothing about it. And then you understand that they didn't exist and someday you won't either. And your entire purpose in life becomes, you know, that you need to put as much of your influence into the world, the best parts of you into the world as possible before you go because no one's gonna remember you. In a hundred years, I don't care if I achieve everything in the world, no one's gonna remember me in a hundred years, there'll be someone else. And that's fine, I'll be dead. But I want to leave an influence on the world when I go that I know that you might not know me, but I, I did something that affected the world in a positive way. So when I looked at where is that coming from, to answer his question the most roundabout way possible, um, I finally identified that I have a drive from insult. Um, when people tell me I can't do something, I think it's the, the short four foot 11 guy in me who played basketball and they said you're too small to play in this game. Something takes over where I just want to go after it with reckless abandon because I want to prove that I can do something. I like the challenge. I don't like, you know, an 80 or 90% chance of success. That sucks. Everyone can do it. It's boring. I want the 0.0001% of chance of success because then when you win, it's, it's, an, it's an incredible feeling. So, you know, whether it be going after it in, my, in the music career and they said you can't, you know, break more than one act and I wanted to break 10 or you can't do TV so we're going to do TV or you can't, you know, you can't do a concert in Manchester two weeks after an attack. Fuck you terrorist, yes we can. Like, um, and, and now like putting together this benefit, like, I want people to tell me I can't do something and then I get excited. It's actually, I've realized the majority of the most pitiful moments in my life are people telling me I can't do something. My wife, I should not have been able to pull her. <laughs> I went after that. I was like, that, I'm going to marry her because she's just far out of my league. And now we have two babies and she's going to have a hard time leaving me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> uh, so... Um, 
You know, as you started to become your own person in the world, call it, you know, those formative years, teenage, 20s, uh, are there any books that really profoundly impacted you and how so? Um, I know what you're doing there. That's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, a Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's a very important book in my life that I read, actually was recommended to, by, by you. Um, uh, the Operator about David Geffen. He hates the book. Please don't put out there into the internet world that I suggested this book because my, my, my hero has now become my mentor and I don't want to say it, but that book changed my life. I read about David and I just thought, here's this guy with nothing in the mailroom who became the most powerful, incredible you know, person in the entertainment industry. And I remember exactly, I was 19 years old in a dorm room reading that book and I remember the page that changed my life. Uh, John Lennon was having a solo career and everyone was trying to sign John Lennon. And I'm literally in my room screaming at the book, go to Yoko Ono. Don't go through his manager. Don't go through this. Like, go to Yoko Ono. She has the influence. And I turned the page and David was the only person who went to Yoko Ono and signed John Lennon for his solo career. And I was like, I can do this. And, uh, <laughs> and I also like David because I was a fanatical Superman fan since we were kids. And as I got older, I realized I wasn't Superman. You know, I started to realize that although I love basketball, God didn't bless me with NBA size or skill. And although I love Michael Jackson, although my dance moves are nice, um, my singing voice wasn't there. But the dance moves were, we were ready, guys. We were ready. Um, and and uh, David was Batman. You know, he was the human superhero to me. He was, uh, he was someone who wasn't born with these superpowers but was able to figure it out. And that book changed my life. Um, so uh, you include an element of philanthropy in everything that you do at your company, SB Projects, and you encourage your artists uh, that you manage to do the same. Why? Our mom. Um, our mom, you know, on, we, we were Jews, so we weren't celebrating Christmas, but she would take us to, you know, um, a soup kitchen to serve people. Um, she, on Hanukkah, would make us choose one present one day and we'd have to choose a charity to give the next day and switch on and off. Uh, when I started throwing parties in college after I sold fecaris, um, uh, Hold on, can I just jump in here? Uh, so, <laughs> my senior year in high school, my brother came back, no, my junior year in high school, my brother came back as a freshman from Emory University uh, and had with him a gray colored roll of cloth that he suddenly started showing up at all of my friends and I's uh, high school parties with a camera and magically could print us fake IDs <laughs> over the break. Just want to point out, although this is highly illegal, yeah, best big brother ever. Yeah, <laughs> it was amazing. And so I want to commend you for that, that yeah. short-lived um, career. But, uh, but I wasn't making them, my friend made them and I had a very strict policy on how we want to get caught. He broke my policy, so I only did that for two months, and I was out. Sure enough, he got caught six months later. Uh, but now that I've said it publicly, come get me. Um, <laughs> but uh, what were we talking about when I said that? Um, philanthropy and, oh. and, and mom. So fake IDs and philanthropy, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, our mother, you know, did not influence me to sell fake IDs, but she influenced me to give. And when I started throwing parties, she couldn't really understand it, what was going on. And I promised her every fourth party, I'd give it all to charity. And I kept that going. We became the largest college party promotion company in the country um, pretty quickly. Um, gave a lot of money to a lot of different charities. And when I started uh, working with Jermaine Dupri at SOSADEF, I was 20 years old. I was a vice president at 20. And um, I tried to institute different things, was doing it from there, still throwing my parties. And when I finally started my own company at 24 years old, I made a promise to myself that everything I would do would include a charitable component. And my brother came to me and he said, look, it's actually, well, you could say it's your idea. Why don't you explain to them what happens? Statistically. Oh, you can go okay, ahead. well, any for-profit business that has a non-profit component statistically does better. People will support you if they know that you're giving back. And um, that is a fact. And my brother introduced that fact into my life, um, also teaching me that we were never going to call non-profits anything but for-purpose from now on. They're not nonprofits, they're for purpose companies. That's something that my brother came up with that I like also. Um, and 
And I, I went to my artists and I said, look, this is something that's important to me. Can we give a portion of every ticket sold at every concert we do to charity? And I've never had one artist say no, ever. Um, we've donated millions to plenty of different charities. Um, between our artists, we're the number one make-a-wish giver of any management company in the world. Um, and we've supported Adam's charity and built a tremendous amount of schools together. And uh, I, I think if you give people an opportunity to do good, they'll choose to do good. And I, uh, I think my industry, you know, you, uh, you think of it as kind of disgusting and, you know, uh, sharks and snakes everywhere. And um, I think that's true. There's definitely a lot of bad people. Um, but there's, I think, like in our country right now, there's a lot of, there are a lot more good people. There's just a lot of bad people being really loud. Um, so, uh, that's the end of that answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so last night, uh, I was on Instagram and your wife, Yale, uh, has a new show on Facebook watch through her company, uh, Mother Lucker. And it's her mommy blog. Yes. And Mother Lucker. It's very on brand with my wife's charity that she started, Fuck Cancer. So my wife's the founder of Fuck Cancer and now she started Mother Lucker. There's a trend. It's yeah. taking place here. <laughs> so anyway, in this video that I was watching, you know, kind of cozying up um, for a Friday night meal, and I opened up my phone, and I, I, I'd say, oh, Yale's got a new video, and I, I watched it with my wife. And um, there's multiple short clips of various couples speaking about their pregnancy-related experience. And as I'm watching it, I see my brother say to the camera, um, the first person I told about the pregnancy of my second child was Kanye West. So I want to know as your brother. It's not. <laughs> what <want> the hell? <laughs> you feel the same way? My other brother's here too. So uh, there, yeah. there's five of us in our family. Um, okay, no, it's actually not busted. <laughs> it's a good story. I was on the phone. I, I, so I managed Kanye. And I was on the phone with Kanye having a conversation. And as I'm having a conversation, my wife's trying to get my attention with, um, you know, and, and we had just put our son to bed. And I'm like trying to finish the conversation. And she's like, I got to talk to you. And I was like, give me two seconds. And she's like, and I went, you're pregnant? And he went, who's pregnant? <laughs> and I said, my wife's pregnant. I just found out. And he goes, that's amazing. And then he goes, wait a second, like just now? And I was like, yeah, just now. And he goes, am I the first person to know? I was like, yeah. And he's like, that's amazing. <laughs> and we were, we were at a point where we couldn't tell people yet. And then I was like, so yes, technically. <laughs> tech, I, I'm going to buy him, I'm going to give him a pair of Yeezys. Like, you know, it'll be, it'll be cool. But yes, he's, he's uh, a Kanye West baby. That's, that's if you guys have one more, I better find out before Kanye West. That's yeah, that is, fair. that is fair. That is fair. So, so uh, let's, let's flip it. But the how cool is bit. that? Like the first person who finds out in the world, if you're going to tell somebody, Adam, you're cool and everything, but you're not <laughs> Kanye. <laughs> you, know, you didn't make college dropout. I love you. But like. um, so, so what is something uh, in general that scares you? Um, oh, man, you're going deep, especially on this week. So I'm not going to get emotional. I'm just going to tell the story. This week I've been, um, after, hmm, one of my artists, Ariana Grande, had a terrorist attack at her show. It was in uh, Manchester. I'm sure you guys have heard about it at this point. Um, and I worked very hard, and I threw on a small Italian girl's shoulders the burden of doing a show two weeks later. At first, we weren't going to do it. Then she came to me and she said, okay, what's your idea again? I need to do something. Otherwise, these people died in vain. And um, she stepped up in a way that for the rest of my life, I'll always respect her and everyone else should too because the, what she did is she changed the narrative for all those families. And I met those families. That was an amazing thing. Um, afterwards, we actually met those families, one of the victims, one by one for 10 minutes each, she and I. That wasn't something we did publicly. It was something we did in private. Um, and I got to look those people in the eye and realize that as much as we're doing a great thing and people clap, good job, Manchester, thank you, their lives are changed forever. They, they don't have mom coming home. They don't have dad coming home. They don't have their son or their daughter or their friend. They're gone forever. And that idea that, you know, you're not there when you could be there is my biggest fear because 
uh, my friend Bun B, a very famous rapper from Houston, called me as he was being evacuated, and his friends are losing something in Texas. He's the, uh, he came up with the idea for the telethon, and he just didn't have the resources to do it, and he called me because of Manchester, and sometimes I jump in without thinking. So the next thing you know, within 24 hours, I had all the networks locked in and everything, and I'm like ready to go, and then I realized this is going to be a lot of work. And thankfully, a lot of people signed up pro bono to help because no one can do it alone. And, and the people that have been helping me with this thing, it's just incredible. Uh, but with the president that we have, and for those of you who support him and voted for him, I have nothing against you. I think that you make your decision, and I don't think someone's a racist if they voted for Donald Trump. I think that people make, there's a lot of decisions to be made when you vote for the president of the United States. That being said, when he became president, I believed that we had to give him a chance because I actually believe in the process. I think that once a president's elected, you have to come together as a country. You can't criticize anymore and we have to heal. I did that and he's let me down. Um, I don't feel comfortable leaving my two and a half year old in front of the television alone if the president of the United States is speaking. Fundamentally and morally, that is a problem for me. Uh, I don't expect you to be the greatest president in the world, but I expect you to be dignified in a way where you respect others and at least do things in a manner that protects citizens and even non-citizens who come forward and give you their trust. What just happened now with DACA, I think is disgraceful because he could have said, we need to work on this, Congress, I need you to put it in the law. But instead, he made a lot of people very, very fearful, fearful where 100% of DACA has never committed a felony. Eight out of 10 voters actually believe dreamers should be citizens. And how he handled that made me very upset. So I'm starting to look at the landscape and I'm like, okay, cool, I don't like him very much. Who are the leaders? And I'm not seeing a tremendous amount of leadership. I'm seeing the same old thing. And I'm probably, for the first time, wanting to involve myself in the process, like many of you for the first time, because you feel a need. It's like when a bone breaks, it feels stronger. Like you feel like you have to do something. So when I'm doing Manchester, it took a lot out of me. When I'm doing this benefit, it takes a lot out of me. And the biggest fear for me when you ask me what I'm scared of is I feel an absolute responsibility to step up for my fellow man and woman and do something with this platform I've been giving because I feel like if I don't do it, my platform will get taken away. I don't think, I'm a spiritual person. I think God gives you blessings to give other people blessings. And... Um, but my biggest fear without getting emotional is I've missed putting my son to bed almost every day this week. And something I do, I'll go and I'll work late night and I'll say to my wife, I'm coming, put the kids to sleep and then I'll leave if I have to and she's incredibly understanding. But a lot of times I stay home until she passes out and then I go to work all night if I have to. But this week, I'm, I'm missing my kids and what I don't want to be is that dad I described at the beginning. That I give my, myself and as much of my effort to the world and it looks great, but I'm, I'm messing up at home. So my biggest fear is how much I want to I want to do. But my fear is that I that I might fuck up the best thing that ever happened to me. And I, I'm sorry for cursing, but I, I my biggest fear is I need to figure out that balance. Yeah. Um, so. So this is actually one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you is, um, how do you make that decision? Like, what is that mental and emotional calculus when you know that you could be putting Jagger down to bed, but you could also be on a phone call, you could also, you're needed on a flight to be with an artist somewhere. Uh, what is the threshold at which you make a commitment to go in one direction versus the other? Um, I guess I see cameras, so screw it. I guess people are going to find out. Uh, I'll choose my kids over uh, my artists any day. And um, if any of my artists have a problem with that, then they shouldn't work with me. Um, and I, I think the artists that I know I work with, they know I look at them like family, and I will always be for the, there for them like family as long as, as, long as I can. Um, and I think if they're my family, they'll respect what I just said. And I think most of my artists do. Um, the hard part is the bigger things, which now my life, I'm 36 years old and I've had this incredible life so far in music. And for the last 16 weeks, I've had a number one with Despacito. And uh, it's great, but you actually, I'm gonna sidestep, make you happy. Do you know why I put Justin on that song? 
Justin heard it in Colombia and was like, hey, this song all the girls going crazy for, do you know about it? And I was like, funny enough, they just gave it to me to do a remix with another artist. You should do it. And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. But the real reason, he was ready to jump on the song. His idea, I'll give him that. But then I was like, we should do it mostly in Spanish. And Luis, I didn't tell him, Luis wanted us to do it in English. And Luis wanted to do a version in English. He wanted it for crossover radio. And I said, we're going to do it mostly in Spanish. And when I sent it back to the label, they were like, too much Spanish. And I was like, no, 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 I'm going to personally work this record myself because Donald Trump is the president of the United States and I want a record in Spanish to be the number one record on the radio. So, um, so, so that's actually, and I didn't think it would go 16 weeks. I thought we'd get like one week and then it was the whole summer and that was great. Um, um, but it, what was I saying beforehand? I haven't slept. Help me out. <laughs> what was I saying before? Like I looked at you, I got lost. I got lost. What was it? Uh, you, you, you answered that specific question, which was about the calculus of how you decide between family oh, or artist. Got it. I'm back. I'm back. Um, and the other part of it, how I decide, is um, I just have to believe that when my boys grow up, I'm going to be there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out that balance. But I also think being home with them all the time isn't the best thing for them. I think they should see that their dad goes to work and works really hard with purpose. And um, what I will make sure is whenever they call me, I call them right back or I pick up the phone. Because my dad did that for me and my mom did that for me. And I want them to know how important they are in my life, but I also feel like they sh if, if I'm helping people, that teaches them to help people. So I kind of, I'm, I'm still figuring out. I'm a work in progress. Um, so Severly, what's something that centers you? You are one of the people that center me. You come at me a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, since, and my brother, uh, he said a lot of nice things about me, so I'll say some nice things about my brother. Um, and since there's two of them here, I'll do two nice things. Um, my brother, Adam, was someone that when he was younger, he was the opposite of me. I was public service, and Adam wanted to be the richest man in the world. He would be like, someday, I'm going to go into a suit store and see the curtains and say, when I get back, it should be a suit. <laughs> <laughs> And he was like 11. <laughs> yeah, I was probably 11 or 12. And, and who he's become now as a man, like, he's dedicated his entire life to helping people. Pencils of Promise is an amazing organization. He, had, he was on that semester at Sea Boat that got hit by the tsunami wave, um, and they thought it was certain death, and they survived. It changed his life. If you want to read a great New York Times bestseller, read my younger brother's book, Promise of a Pencil. It's an incredible story. Um, and, and how he lives his life inspires me because seeing him and my wife dedicate their time to helping others full time, you know, it does center me. It kind of makes things, you realize what's important because I get to look at these schools and he's going to third world countries and giving an opportunity of education to someone who desperately wants it um, and changing lives. And actually makes me think about our own education system because we're always talking about Oh, we need this, we need that. Well, we, honestly, I'm just going to say this out loud because this is something I really want to work on in California because it sucks to me that the public schools aren't good enough in this state when we are the seventh wealthiest, you know, economy in the world. Um, we need to stop talking about what's happening in the schools and start helping these kids with what's going on at home and around them so that they can focus when they get to school. Um, so... Because I, I, you, you, can put a, you can put a book in front of a kid. This is what I learned watching him. You can put a book in front of anybody, but you have to give them the, they have to have the, the incentive to learn. And one of my brother's things with Pencil of Promise is how much of the labor has to be contributed from the community? Uh, so at least 20% of the funding of every school comes from the communities, and these are people that usually live in mud huts or bamboo huts or corrugated tin shacks, and so they don't have money, and so they physically uh, build their schools with the support of the Pencil of Promise teams and staff. And the reason they do that, which I learned from him, which is giving me this idea for this state, is when you put your hard work into something, you own it. And you appreciate it. And it's not just some guy from a first world country building you a building and saying, now you have a school. Like, you have ownership. People want to take pride in what they have. Um, so, so that's the, the first thing. You influence me tremendously with the work that you do. And you're always willing to center me and balance me. Uh, I will tell a nice story about my brother, Sam. So I have um, a biological brother, Adam, biological sister, Liza, and then I have two adopted brothers, Sam and Cornelio. Now, he's on the stage embarrassing him. Sam, stand up so I can embarrass you. Stand, no, yep, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Big Sam. Okay. All right. 
Now sit your ass down. <laughs> Still your older brother. <laughs> uh, no, uh, when Sam, uh, Sam is originally from Mozambique, and when Sam and Cornelio, kids always lived in and out of our house. My father is a refugee in this country. So for him, it was very important to kind of always give back and help. And for my mother too. So there was always a bedroom for someone. And Sam and Cornelio, it's a long roundabout story about how they came to our family. But um, my parents ended up, were, my dad was going to help them find an opportunity. And Cornelio, my other brother in broken English, said, can we stay? And my dad said, yeah, another couple weeks, sure. And he goes, no, forever. And we actually had a family meeting that night. And my parents became their legal guardians and adopted them. And um, when you guys went to school the very first day, uh, you and Cornelio came back and you were both very worried because um, you had books and you guys didn't speak the best English and we were trying to figure out like what is the problem and where they are from you cannot take the books from your school because all the other kids need to use the books and people kept putting books in their backpack and shoving them to the next classroom <laughs> and they were scared that they were going to get in trouble because they had books and uh, a lot of people have said to my family over the years, whew, a lot of people have said to my family over the years how great it's, we've been to them. And um, Sam, as my brother, I want to tell you, you are a big influence in my life because you made me a better person by being in my life. So to you and my brother, thank you. Whew. Whew. <clears throat> um, we're bringing it today. Yeah. <laughs> so. By the way, by far the biggest softie in our family is this one. Oh yeah. By not far. Even, not even a question. <laughs> See, I got you too. Oh man. I think like once a week I'll say to Tahil and my wife, I'd be like, should we just watch some X Factor and cry a little bit tonight? <laughs> like I would love a good cry. It would feel great. My favorite show is gone. I loved uh, Extreme Home Makeover. Yeah. Extreme Home Makeover. They move the bus. Yeah. Every single time I was like, yeah, move that bus. <laughs> um, so, you know, you live a very public life, right? You have millions of followers on Instagram, on Twitter, etc. You're associated with all these artists that live even more public lives. How do you decide where you draw the line between your public and your private life? And I'm sure a lot of people in here are leading amazing companies, organizations, and they have to make the same decision too. And so how do you think about it and how would you advise anyone here? Um, we decided with our, with our children, we didn't want to put them on social media at all. And for the first year of our son Jagger's life, we never had him on. And then we started going to like some of my artist concerts and kids are like, oh my God, and next thing you know, we'd see like pictures of our kids online. So we decided the first year is ours. The first year we don't put our children on. Like that first year is just us. And then after that, if we want to put pictures up, the world has changed. I'd rather people know that they're the majority of my life than not know. Um, and that's something I wrestle with. My mentor yells at me all the time. You shouldn't be putting your kids up. Um, but the way I also look at it is I'm going to protect my family from bad people. I'll figure that out. But uh, when I came into my industry, the stigma was fast cars, fast women. That's what a male executive in the entertainment business was. And then I found out Richard Branson, who I thought of as like James Bond with tons of women, has actually been faithfully married for 38 years and has two children that he loves and grandchildren and is this amazing entrepreneur who's also an amazing family man. Um, and then I found out that Jeffrey Katzenberg is an incredible family man. And I'm proud to say his son, who's one of the hardest working guys I know, um, is the producer of it and it's going to do 100 million this weekend and I'm proud as hell of my friend David. Um, but I didn't know that about these guys because no one advertises it. So I just decided I want to change that. So I decided I'm going to start showing my family life as much as my business life because that's more important. People should come into the business and not want to be a sleazebag. Um, and and when I did, uh, when I did the, the cover of Success, I actually asked him, I was like, you know, it's a weird title for you guys to have. I'm sure it's really interesting because that definition of what is success is such an interesting thing to talk about because as a society, we all have very different definitions. And I guess what I want to do with social media and what I choose to do is I want to change the definition of my business that you can be a good husband, a good father, and a good friend and still be successful 
and, and have the right intentions. And there's always going to be people who talk shit. I'm doing a benefit on Tuesday. I was supposed to be in Hawaii on vacation this week. Canceled the vacation. I'm doing the benefit. I have people who just finished the VMAs and they were supposed to take a vacation producing the VMAs and they're now producing the show for me pro bono. And people are like, oh, look at you getting these celebrities together so they can just look good. You know what? That's fine. There's a lot of people that are going to think that. But when we raise 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 million dollars for people that need it, call me whatever the fuck you want. I gotta stop cursing. I gotta, I gotta stop doing that. I'm a um, dad now. So, so when's the last time? But I'm also a Jets fan. I curse a yeah, lot. Yeah, I need to. It's, it's 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 a hard life, but it's good though for any football fans. First of all, if you don't know football, let me explain. My team is the worst team in the NFL. Like we might just go 0 and 16. We are not very good right now. But for my son, you know how important it is that he's a Jets fan for my two boys because they are about to live this extraordinary life surrounded by celebrity and wealth and all this different stuff, but every Sunday they will be losers. <laughs> and they will be humbled. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd also like to point out to all the NFL fans in the room that right now, the Patriots are alone in dead last in the NFL. And that's our cause for celebration. <laughs> We, we are such sore losers. We are <laughs> such sore losers. So I'll keep going. Um, so, so when's the last time that you feel like you really stepped outside of your comfort zone? I went to Burning Man. Tell us about it. I Tell went, us about it. Yeah, I went to Burning Man. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, you're not supposed to talk about it, I don't think. But um, I, I've said no to a friend for like six years straight and going to Burning Man. I was like, I'm not going to Burning Man. Like, I'm not, I don't do drugs. So I'm not going to Burning Man. And... Um, Finally, a buddy of mine got me to go. I actually don't want to tell you guys because I don't want you to go. I want it just to stay the way it was. Look, I, I, at the end of the day, I went out there and my friend convinced me and I was actually starting the work on the benefit. And uh, I was like, I can't go now. I had another excuse. And my wife was worried about me because of the Manchester thing and she wasn't really sure. And she said, you know what? Your staff says they can handle it. We're just going for two days. You can go. And uh, I went to a community where a, a city shows up in the middle of the desert. And people are not spending money and they're taking each care, care of each other and they're giving each other, you know, food and drink and saying hello and some people are naked and that's, that's their thing. And, but um, I, we grew up around a park named Bible Street Park in Coscob, Connecticut and I used to ride my bike like a wild man. And I'm 36 years old and I was 15 again because I was riding my bike around that playa like a damn wild man. So much so that in my mind it was an electric bike and the next day I woke up like not being able to move Realizing I had pedaled all of that um, But it was uh, it was also the first time because there is no reception there It is the first time in over 10 years that I did not have a phone for 48 hours um, And I've been good about oh my phone down or that I had no phone in fact I gave it to my wife. I said not even pictures just take it away from me for two days I made a commitment to myself. I'm gonna do this and um, two things happened one I met me again, you know, I just got to, I got to reset and have the strength to come back and work even harder because you can lead, but if you're weak, you can't really lead. And, um, and the other thing that really was great is I've, we've been parents for two and a half years. And I think for any of you in a relationship, you know, when the kids come, the relation, it's really tough on a relationship. Like the kids come first and you know, it, it's, it's hard. And marriage is hard. It's work. But I think for me and my wife, it was a really great thing because we dated. Like for two days, we, were, we weren't parents. We were just us. And it might sound selfish for those of you who don't have kids. Like it's actually really important in any marriage that you find time to just be you. Otherwise, you know, it, it's a mentor of mine, I won't say who, said to me, um, sign your wife. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, someone should have told me this a long time ago, sign your wife. And I was like, what does that mean? He goes, when you have a client or a deal that you're chasing, you will give up everything to get that deal done. You will wine and dine. You will put it all into it because you want to get it done. You want to sign it. But once you have your wife or your husband, time goes by and you kind of just, oh, you want to come out for dinner? No, I'm going to watch the game. Oh, this show. Like you kind of just sit next to each other and you, you don't sign each other. So uh, 
I actually took his advice, and marriage is still hard, and I love my wife, and it's up and down. That's what marriage is, but I now have this advice. I'm extending it to all you guys. Like, sign your spouse. You know, it's actually worthwhile, and that's what we did at Burning Man. We took the time for each other, and it was great for our relationship, and, um, and, and yeah, that, that was Burning Man. I didn't think I was going to tell you guys it was Burning Man, but I also wore the craziest outfits. I was, I, I'm Jewish, so I returned to the desert as Moses. <laughs> Um, so we just have a few seconds left, but no, I want to go like a minute longer just to make them freak out a little bit. Um, well, uh, maybe, maybe <laughs> we're at 32 seconds. We're going to go like a minute 32. <laughs> um, so, you know, growing up in our house, our, our mom had certain things framed, right? Like phrases, poems, etc. Um, and there were things that I think stuck with both of us. And when you think about the important phrases or poems or just moments of inspiration that you would want your kids to see on a daily basis, what are those things that you not only think about for your kids, but that you would share with this audience as we wrap up now that we're beyond the allotted time? Oh, yeah, we're at zero. Yeah. Um, we're going to do two things. Sorry, yeah. guys. Um, one, I would say read Rudyard Kipling's If... Our dad gave us that, put us on our wall, great poem, talks about what it takes to be an adult uh, in the world. Um, two, read Steve Jobs, the cra two, here's the crazy ones. Um, it's a great one. Uh, three, um, the bronze are different thing. Like if you t start telling your children from the, like, the moment they wake up, the moment they go to sleep, that they are extraordinary, they will start to believe you and do extraordinary things. Um, and there was a poem given to me um, David Geffen showed me this poem. It's called Ithaca. I named my holding company after it. Uh, it's a Greek poem, and it talks about the journey. And it talks about going to the island of Ithaca and you, all the things that you'll see along the way. And when you finally get to Ithaca, if you find her poor, she would not have fooled you because now you truly understand what Ithaca really means, which is life is a journey. It goes up and down, but you enjoy it. And then um, that answers that question, but I do want to do one thing I, I like to do when I do talks that I've learned from a friend of ours. Um, so... Answer the question honestly and don't try and be slick. Because I, this, is, this goes to this whole definition of success. Um, raise your hand if I told you I would give you a job for the next year. It would be a horrible job. But you wouldn't have to do anything immoral. It would just be a horrible job. But you would make a billion dollars in the next 12 months. I would, guys, most of you would take a billion dollars for like a bad job for one year. But so maybe not everyone. Keep your hands raised. Um, raise your hand if you had a billion dollars and someone you loved got sick. Would you spend all billion to save them? Okay. Keep your hands raised. If you got sick, would you spend the billion dollars to save yourself as well? If it wasn't going to go away from your family, family's not affected. Just this, you save your life so you can live another day. Who would save themselves? Interesting, okay. Um, the point is, between those scenarios, everyone in this room is already a billionaire if you have your health and the, your loved ones. You know, so... Um, I, I learned this from a friend. I wanted to share it with you guys because it just, life is perspective. And I think a lot of people I meet at conferences like this and, you know, when we speak to, you know, students... They're, they're trying to figure out how to get to the next thing and how to get to the next thing and how do I, how do I get financial gain. And, um, and what they're missing is that they're already there if they were on top of the mountain and they got sick. If you have your health and you have your loved ones, you're playing with house money and enjoy your life. Work hard, but don't miss out on the things right in front of you. On that. And if it ends...